Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. Uh, I'm a little sick, sorry. I'm your host, Ricky Camillari, and our next guests are the director and star of the upcoming reimagining, if you will, of the Hansel and Gretel fairy, Gretel fairy tale, now titled Gretel and Hansel. In it, director Osgood Perkins taps Sophia Lillis to play older sister Gretel, who leads her younger brother deep in the woods on a hunt for food where they find an evil old woman and some brilliantly horrifying imagery. Please welcome director Osgood Perkins and star Sophia Lillis. Let's hear it. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, you guys. My pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, congratulations on the movie. Uh, I love the look of it. Um, let's talk about how this started. You ha wrote and directed your previous two movies, correct? So this is the first time. Is this the first time you're working with a, a script that isn't, isn't your initial work? Yeah, uh, very much so. It, it came to me, and what I loved about it was how faithful it was to the original story. It didn't clutter. There was not a lot of clutter in the narrative. You know, a lot of things added. A lot of times in, in sort of fairy tale reimaginings, the writers and the, feel the need to sort of insert a lot of orcs and crossbows and armies and things and we kept it three characters which is essentially what it always was fairly stripped down and bare i mean you kept it a a, a horror story which is a horror story doesn't need as soon as you start inserting those things in a horror movie you lose a lot of the fear and the tension well i think what we wanted to embrace and really go with like you know you get wind in your sails right and the big wind for a movie like this is the fact that everybody knows Hansel and Gretel, everybody feels something about it, whether they kind of know it or not. It's sort of embedded in our collective consciousness. So um, yeah, to change it would almost be to kind of lose the power of it in a way. So yeah, we kept it, uh, we kept it as, as clean as we could. What was it like for you as a director working with uh, source material that wasn't your own making? Was, did you find it limiting or freeing in a way? Um, it's freeing in the sense that y y you can kind of say, well, that part is done. Now it's time for me to put my stamp all over it, as opposed to sort of fretting everything from the beginning. When you sit down to write something as an original piece, every decision is yours, and that's super daunting, as you can imagine. So when sort of everything is in place already, it's very freeing to then design what's going to happen. It's also hard to um, recognize some things that not necessarily don't work is maybe the wrong way to put it, but recognize things that, yeah, maybe that don't work that are of your own making because you're so, you came up with them, you imagine them, they work in your head, whereas somebody else's material, you can be like, that doesn't work for me, I'm going to try this instead. Yeah, it's equally easy to love and hate things. When you write stuff for yourself, it's, you're mostly hating, what, at least I am, mostly thinking, oh man, that's so wrong and bad and dumb. Everything that you I write? Stink. Yeah. You know, like that's, yeah. the, that's the plight of the writer, right? You sit in front of ah. But if someone else has done it, you sort of say, oh, well, it's probably pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, how, how did you get involved with the project and what drew your interest? Well, uh, I got the script and, uh, a little while ago and um, like not even like a week after, um, I got uh, told that I was going to have a uh, Skype interview with, uh, with Oz Good. And, How was that? Uh, what? How, How was, was that? Interview? How was the Skype it was, interview? It was, it was good. How did I do? Uh, I uh, liked the script. I thought it was good, but what really made me want to do the project was Oz Good because I felt like um, I would have a lot of fun working with him, and he seemed like an interesting guy. It feels weird saying this now that you're here. Uh, <laughs> it feels weird to hear it now yeah. that I'm here. <laughs> Go on and tell me more about Don't me being stop. a nice guy. Uh, is that something that you pride yourself on as a director? I mean, I guess every director would say, of course I'd create a nice environment on the set, but um, uh, you've made a few movies very quickly. It seems that people really want to work with you and like working with you. It's funny that you say that. I feel like Hollywood is one of those places where you can actually be a total jerk yes. and still totally succeed. Um, in this case, it's nice to be nice. <laughs> and it's nice to be liked, and it's nice to have people want to be around you. It's nice to be not toxic, yes. right? Yes. How great it is to not be toxic. What, um, what made you want to work with uh, Sophia? Well, here, a couple of things. First of all, Sophia had already made such an impact on the world, really, with what she had done previous to this movie. And, and so when you, when you can have someone on your side who the world is already saying, yeah, 
to that person, it's it's such fuel for for your creative you know energies. It's it's like it's like filling up the tank. You know, you come in with someone who's great. Um, so much of it is done. You you hear that like you know making movies is X percent casting, ninety nine percent or fifty percent or whatever percent, um, and it's true because at a certain point I can't do her job. I can't even tell her how to do her job. Um, I can help her find what's righter than not, or what's more right than that, or what you know what sort of translates better. I can't tell her what. I, I don't say do this this way. It's crazy. She knows what to do. Um, and the other thing about Sophia, and I'll say it in front of her, is that she has really amazing movie eyes, and that's kind of what film acting is really, for me, always all about. Michael Caine's thing in his book was always don't blink. The only, the only rule of film acting is you don't blink. And Sophia rarely, it's really kind of a brilliant thing to say, like the great actor Steve McQueen never blinks, blinked, the Steve McQueen, the actor. And, and when you have eyes like Sophia does that the camera can read, um, the casting goes from 90% the job to 99% the job. And I can pretty much just say cut. There's also uh, every now and then an actor, and this is going to be weird that I'm saying this while you're right here, and I'm sorry that's not a question. <laughs> an actor or an actress comes along and they get on the screen, and for me, I go, who's that? What's happening here? Where did this person come from? And I had that when I saw you in It, uh, which was just sort of like, wait a second, that's a new face that you has to appear more. There's something being said there that is intangible that nobody else really has right here. You have no idea how to control that, I'm sure, like what that even means for you as a person. It's just everybody being like, you do something great. But the camera does that for people, and yeah. that's one of the great sort of magics of movies is that some people, not everybody at all, but some people just have it. Uh, uh, how many people have done that to you, huh? More than once. Yeah. <laughs> What was the shoot like? I know you guys shot in Ireland and yeah. uh, primarily in the woods, as the movie suggests. So was it cold? Was it warm? What was the shoot it, like? It was pretty cold, but um, it was very beautiful um, just being there, not even seeing it on screen, but uh, just being there in the woods. It was amazing. Um, it rain. It rains a lot. Yeah, that's true. And in Ireland, they say we have they we they they say that they have all four seasons in an hour, <laughs> and it's really true. It's like you know, freezing. You know, it's sunny. It's raining. It's windy. It's all these things. But the real for me, the funniest part was that we would go out to these locations and sort of like look at what we were going to shoot, and you could tell the Irish from people from California because it was raining, and it rains like this way like in your face rain and all of the people who are Irish are sort of standing there like yeah <laughs> rain in the face is what we like like rain in the face is how we grow yeah, like and that. in California we're like we, can we get back to the hotel yeah. you know and uh, so they're amazing in Ireland Ireland is a special place yeah. did you have a primary visual influence for the those shots in the woods like even just in the trailer uh those sort of wide angle shots on the faces and the young man that you cast as her younger brother it looks so much like come and see i don't know if you've ever seen that movie that okay never mind it's, it's i'm way out of it it's like a russian either that or i just stole everything from it and i'm saying no i've never seen it i've never seen it uh, just those 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 sort of the how horrifying a wide angle lens can look on a terrified face yeah, I mean, I think uh, whether we like to sort of admit it or not, I don't mind admitting it. I think we're all sort of stealing, nah, stealing. We're all influenced by the masters. Of course we are. And the sort of wide angle look is a very Stanley Kubrick mm -hmm. look. And sort of using these 18 millimeter lenses, which is what we shot most of the movie on. Um, which means the camera is in your face. The camera's <laughs> here, but it's really big. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the idea was to be close to her in a big engulfing world. And we got that look from those lenses and from the aspect ratio, which for anybody out here who cares about aspect ratios, we shot it in a 155 to 1, which is not typical. It's very atypical. Uh, Why is that? It. Well, we chose, we, it, the, the, what that means to everybody is it's more like a square than a rectangle. Okay. It's more this way. It's more like old television in a sense. And the... Which is not something you would normally do with wide, I mean, wide angle, I feel like, People who use that most are shooting in anamorphic or looking for that. Right. Yeah. So the idea was that the 155 aspect ratio, the more square look, felt more like a storybook, for one, yeah. and felt more intimate 
also. The wider the look, for me, the more kind of alienated the characters are. There's a lot more distance between people. Um, in a, a more square format, you're with the character a lot more, and I wanted to make sure that we were with her and him um, as much as we could be. And also, frankly, um, it felt more like a movie. Kind of, television looks like that. Television is wide now. Netflix shows are wide. So to make a theatrical experience, part of what we want to do is make something that actually looks strangely bigger, which works in this aspect ratio. And that's a lot of talk. Someone will understand or care. No, I enjoy. I I cared. I enjoyed that. Thank you. It also lead, lead, leads to a kind of claustrophobic feeling, right? Because you're shooting in such a wide way, but you're closing off the space. You kind of get it all. I, 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 maybe people will start doing it more. I don't know. Um, we hit on something, and we're somehow permitted to do it by the studio. Because like I say, for theatrical movies, it just they don't look like that. Um, what was it like working with the um, young actor who played uh, your younger brother, as well as the actress who plays uh, the witch, for lack of a better The witch, yeah. Yeah, the witch. yeah um, Alice was amazing. Um, as the witch. Um, yeah, she was great. She was such an experienced actor, and I got to learn so much from her just by um, just being there, watching her work, and uh, seeing her kind of develop the character in front of my eyes. And um, Sammy uh, <laughs> is... Uh, I feel like that was his first real big thing, but he you could notice like him learning from... like. Uh, just as we were working and uh, he got to, he, towards the end, he would like, he would be ready to, you know, make another movie. He'd be ready to direct it, in fact. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, no, Sammy was very, he's such an enthusiastic, bright young kid and he, he, he's gonna do great. Um, also, this is your first studio movie per, per se. I'm not exactly sure what that entails anymore. You know, maybe a slightly less control or maybe more conversations about what it is that you're doing at the end of the day. What was that like for you? Um, it was great for me, to be honest with you, because we had the support to make the movie that we wanted to make. It's and a producer that you've worked with prior, right? Uh, no, Brian oh, Cavanaugh-Jones who produced this um, with his partner, Fred Berger, there. No, it was first time for me with these oh, guys. Okay. For some reason, uh, I thought they had done Black Coats. Duck no, and they were, you know, they're, they're friends to the artist, like any really good producer should be. They find a way to make the artist happy enough and the studio happy enough so that somewhere in the middle, you're meeting on the final product. And uh, so I, there, was never any, there was never any time where we ever felt sort of hemmed in or edited or, 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 or shaped by the studio. That was never the case, which did, was really nice. Did you feel a certain sort of pressure yourself? Because I think that uh, what I love about Black Coats uh, is uh, it's like a slow, it's a slow burn horror movie. Um, did you feel any pressure on yourself to sort of not follow through on, uh, on that style as much? And like, oh, I'm making a studio movie. It's going to be playing in theaters all across the country. I have to move a little bit quicker. Maybe I should have thought that way I, I or think something, great. but I really never kind of did. And I think that at the end of the day, what you have, which is what is truly, I think, exciting about this movie is that an opportunity for, it's a PG-13 movie, right? So it's an opportunity for kids to go see a movie that's not like movies they've seen. Yeah. You know, it's not like, oh yeah, that, I know that, or I know how that is. We've, we've done everything sort of differently and we're given the permission by the studio to do that and sort of like the, the sort of a blank card, just go do it. Um, so it was a really, really gratifying experience, to be honest. Were you nervous at all that that was gonna, that may or may not have been the case? There's, I mean, we- I figure someone will stop me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I figure at some point, like, the, the ways movies work, as you all know, is like you shoot your dailies, you shoot something every day, and then you send the, that back to Los Angeles, and they look at it. And, and then they, if, they, if they got a problem, they call you. What are you doing? Why is that? You know, and we didn't Which get those calls. Which is such a strange process to me because they're dailies. Nothing's getting cut together yet. Right. So, you, so if you're getting the, what are you doing, phone call, you're really in bad shape. You know, so we never got that phone call. We never had any of those issues. And so, um, no, we, we started and, and it was smooth. Your DP on the film is the same guy that shot Roma, right? Well, he's uncredited as shooting parts of Roma. I mean, he's, oh, okay. he's, he was one of the, uh, I guess, second unit directors or something. I think he had a lot of 
I personally like, did I, Quaron himself shoot Rumble Quaron tonight? Shot, shot it. Yeah, it, right. I can't imagine that Gallo didn't have a lot to do with it because he's so gifted and so such a sweetheart and so present and so um, artful. And what made you sort of had had you worked with him before? How did you know of him? No, um, I met him on the phone. Uh, he said my English isn't great. I said my Spanish is worse than your English, and we had a really nice phone call. I I liked him because the first thing he said to me was, you know, when I read the script, I didn't like it. He said it was one of those things where it's like you read it once, you don't like it. The second time you read it, you really don't like it, and then the third time you read it, it's your favorite script that you've red he's like it's like a really great album it's like a, it's like an album that you buy and you're like oh man this sucks i'll try again oh this really sucks third time what have i been thinking this is the best album i've ever heard so um when he came when he's someone who's able to say i thought the script sucked the first time i read it now i love it um is a thoughtful person plus i felt like strangely that the kind of I don't want to say language barrier, but that the language, uh, the fact of our sort of language differences was going to create kind of a, I don't want to say a new language, but a new vocabulary in a way, because I was going to have to trust him and he was going to have to trust me. And in the end, we, I, think we, I think we won that battle. That's a pretty daring proposition. We may create a new language while shooting our movie. <laughs> See to your pants, man. You, yeah. you, I mean, it, it, you have to do all this stuff with a certain amount of kind of I could fail at any time. You know, I think when, why not? when you get smug and complacent, that's when you start making dull work. And I think when you're a little bit like, Arr, that's when, I mean, Black Oak's daughter was horrifying. I was horrified every day. I woke up every day thinking I'm going to die. You know, I'm going to die. It's too cold here. We don't have enough money. I don't know what I'm doing. It's too cold. Have I mentioned it's too cold? Um, and uh, Where were you shooting it? In Ottawa, in February, in Canada. It was minus 40 degrees every day. I just came from there. It was extremely cold. It's what they do there. Yeah. So um, in any case, to have a little bit, and it, that's also to address your question about the studio, to have a little bit of a kind of a someone watching over you and, and you know, urgh, is also kind of cool. You know, like, it's kind of like, okay, I'll, I'll figure it out. Let's do this. As opposed to, I have all the money in the world, all the time in the world. Everyone says yes to me. You know what those movies turn out to be. It's like Phantom Menace. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Via, you, uh, after it, this is maybe your, so this is like your second horror movie, or third, really, I guess, kind of. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, are you a horror fan yourself? Uh, or have you just sort of... Fallen into portraying I've, these characters? It, a little bit. Um, but uh, I've come to start to love horror films by being in them. I feel like I have kind of a strange appreciation for them because um, they're just, I feel like I've come to realize how fun they are to shoot. Um, What's fun about them, shooting them? Um, just, I feel like there's a whole new, it's just being on set. It's, it's not just going to be like a regular set. It's something's going to happen, something strange, something wonderful. The sets for this, for instance, the, the witch's house, um, just being in the woods itself, just everything is just so strangely creepy but beautiful and nothing you would get if it wasn't, you know, also not horror, you know? Right. So... Um, and you really get to do the ext extreme emotions in a horror movie all over That's the place. That's true. You get to be sad at someone perishing. You get to be horrified. You also have to have laughs a little bit here and there in a it's, horror movie. You know, it's always going to be a 10. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, no, you really get, <laughs> you know, you really have to be, you know, it's, it's terrifying as well. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Twitter. Is uh, This is a very dark take on a fairy tale that's already a bit dark. In what way did you amp it up and take it to the next level? Also, in which ways did you maybe tone it down as well? In <laughs> uh, 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 which way did we amp it up? Uh, I think when what we tried to do is look at the elements of the fairy tale and sort of foreground them. For instance, the fact that you know it's sort of easy to say from this point that look, this is a story about a woman who lives in the woods who builds a house to lure children so she can eat them, right? So it's a, it's, a cannib it's a cannibal woman in the woods eating children. So it's like, as soon as you start to, right? It's like, we all knew that. You all knew that coming in here. But as soon as I start to say it that way, it starts to become a little bit like, oh, yeah, that's 
pretty bad. You know, and then so it was sort of becoming like, well, if that's her trip, then what is that look like? What are her spaces look like? What are the places where she does this look like? And all I knew is that it wasn't going to be some oven that looked like it was from The Hobbit or something, you know, because I don't need to see that anymore. You know, you don't need to see that old kind of stuff. So what we tried to lean into the fact is like, well, this is someone who does this in a serial way, right? She does it all the time and she has a certain kind of victim that she likes. So now we have a cannibalistic serial murderer woman who lives in the woods who likes to eat and kill and cook children and feed children to other children, right? It starts to get pretty bad, right? There's like more I talk about it and, it's, and I haven't added anything. I haven't, I haven't added anything to the grim stuff. That's just, what it, that's just what it is, man. So we just tried to sort of say, well, if she's a serial killer, what, what, you know, those people have like places. They have like basements and stuff and they have like killing rooms and horrible things like that. So we, we brought all that in. So that's how we made it. That's how we made it darker. If that was the question, I guess. Um, and then, how did we make it lighter? Um, I don't think we bothered. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have one question from our audience, who has a question right here. Hi. Hi. Thank you Hi. for being here. Um, my question is: Were there any lighter moments on set where it kind of lightened the mood rather than it being scary? Um, AKA, will there be any bloopers or anything that we'll see behind the scenes? Will we see the Gretel and Hansel bloopers? Yeah. We didn't have, there's no time for bloopers. You know, like, uh, bloopers are nice on big budget movies where, like, they're just like, we've got 700 days and we're going to shoot at two hours every day and everyone else can go back to their hotel and we can have fun. Truly, on little movies like this, because it's still a little movie, every day is like, come on. Do, do we have it? Are we doing it? So it's not joyless by any, by any stretch of the imagination. I think everyone's having a good, I hope. I had a great time. She had a great time. <laughs> uh, a good time. But um, I think that, like, s strangely, the way movies are made these days, especially smaller ones, it's kind of like we had 25 days to make this movie, you know? Compared to something like, say, The Exorcist, which has like 180 days, right? So and it's they like, had so many days to make the original Exorcist. Right. It's like it's like, so many days to make everything. Off. We're gonna go shoot here. Yeah, yeah. we'll <laughs> shoot five minutes of this and kind of go home. Yeah. You know, but for us, it's like mm, or, 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 make it happen, get it done, one take, go oh, on next. So sorry to say, not many bloopers. Thanks. No bloopers allowed. There's no schedule. <laughs> Do you feel like um, that even though it was probably like a, a slightly larger budget than you've worked with before, it's a studio. Slightly. You still have 25 days. Uh, do you feel like you know exactly how to work within that schedule at this point? Or is it still in a lot of ways kind of a free for all, just get it done? You, you learn by doing and it's trial by fire and you're lucky to have really great producers and line producers who are actually doing that stuff for you in a sense. I mean, like, yeah, I'm in charge of making sure everything happens, but there's like, also... Do you know what to do with 40 days? Yeah, what I, I think, you know, some people do... What, what I always thought was a brilliant way of approaching this is there are some directors who ask for the schedule to be they shoot the movie and then they shoot the first week again. So they, they do it, and then they come back and they redo the first week, which I think is such a gorgeous notion. Yeah, I would do that with 40 days. because Of course, because, because you've yeah. learned how to work with everybody. Everybody's firing on all cylinders. It's like, like getting to summer camp. You get there like, I don't want to get in the water. I don't want to do anything. But by the time you leave, you're like, I want to do everything, man. Let's get in the water. I would love that. Right? Because So I feel, yeah. yeah, you know what you're doing. Because when you first get there, you're like, hi, I'm Oz, and this is Sophie. <laughs> let's try this timidly. Um, so I think extra days, I honestly, I would start over. Or rehearsal for like a week or two to sort of get yeah. everybody into that place. You could kind well. of, you could kind of, you could kind of write off the first week of shooting as a week of rehearsal shooting. That's a great idea. I've never it heard, is I've a never great heard idea. of that. I know. Wow. But people do that? Yes. <laughs> people who are, who have proven that they can make movies that, yeah, that perform and make money. Yes, and, of course. So, yeah. you know, yes, yes. <laughs> One of these days. Um, uh, I can't wait to see it. I think it looks phenomenal. I've, I've loved your work before. I'm sure I'm going to love this. Yours as well. Uh, it comes out January 31st, which is uh, next week, I believe, correct? It might is be that? two weeks. It's the Thursday before the Super Bowl. Thursday before the Super Bowl. Uh, it's called Gretel and Hansel. Go see it in theaters as an Osgood Perkins movie should be seen and give them a huge round of applause for being here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.